it's heating up between the French and the new team in charge over in Italy. The Italian economy minister cancelling a trip to Paris. In Rome, the French ambassador summoned. This, as new Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte keeps Emmanuel Macron guessing over whether he'll keep his Friday date in the French capital. Conte, who says he doesn't need hypocritical lessons. This after Macron's government uh, called uh, the team of the, of, uh, the new uh, Italian populist coalition, quote, cynical and irresponsible. The reason? Italy and Malta's refusal to take in the 629 migrants stranded aboard the Aquarius off the coast of Italy. At no point did France volunteer to take them in, by the way. In fact, uh, the government here rejected an offer by Corsica's separatist regional government to welcome those migrants. Instead, they're surprise saviors coming from the new government in Spain. We'll be asking our panel about the divisions within Macron's own centrist camp when it comes to how to handle uh, asylum seekers and about a new Italian government that's less than two weeks old, but which has already shown its stripes with far-right leader Matteo Salvini, nominally the junior partner of that coalition, well, stealing the limelight, you might say, from the five-star movement with his anti-immigration stance. From his post as interior minister, is it Salvini running the show in Rome? Salvini, whose partners at the European level include France's far-right National Front. Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at Italy, France, and the rift between them. And with us to talk about it, Anne Le Breton, Paris municipal councillor from Emmanuel Macron's La République en Marche party, the Republic on the March party. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. We want to welcome as well Francois Gemin, researcher at uh, the University of Liège. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. And uh, Gregory Viscusi, reporter for Bloomberg News, is with us in what's been, uh, well, a busy week with a story that uh, seems to be uh, c continuing to escalate. Also joining us uh, from the Paris suburb of Maison Lafitte, Mayor Jacques Mian, former uh, member of the uh, French Parliament's uh, uh, Foreign ah. Affairs uh, Commission from the Conservative Les Républicains Party. Thank you for being with us. Hi. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Let the record state, by the way, that despite uh, Italy's rejection of the Aquarius, the country continues to welcome those making the perilous uh, trip across the sea from Libya. The latest example, a Coast Guard ship docking in the Sicilian port of Catania, letting off 937 tired and weakened migrants, also aboard the Dicciotti, the corpses of two people who died during their voyage, a woman and a teenage boy. Here was the scene earlier this week aboard that other rescue ship, the Aquarius. I had a phone conversation with the Italian interior minister, Matteo Salvini, yesterday, and it was his wish that Rome, Vienna and Berlin... All right, that's the Berlin wrong clip. We'll show, that. We'll show the right clip uh, uh, later on. Uh, we'll, we'll be hearing more from... Uh, that was the uh, German... Uh, interior <clears throat> Minister will be talking about how uh, this is impacting this crisis, uh, the, the whole uh, continent. Uh, let me begin with you, Gregory Viscusi, just to explain to people. Italy continuing to let in, just so our viewers understand, Italy continuing to let in uh, uh, migrants, uh, Italian naval vessels in this instance, bringing those people in, while drawing a line in the sand when it came to the Aquarius. Why? Well, when you say Italy, begin, this is a very divided government, so we're talking <clears throat> Salvini here. Um, the reason is, is that Salvini's people, and he comes from a far-right party that's always had a very anti-immigration line, their line has been that all these, these NGOs are basically sort of trying to push a pro-immigration um, platform on Europe and, and that they're running a taxi service back and forth of immigrants coming to, to um, Europe. False, because it was the Italian Navy, the Italian Coast Guard that asked this Aquarius ship to take on these migrants because their boats were in trouble off the Libyan coast. So the Italian Navy did exactly what they're supposed to do, as you also showed in that case. The other thing that's worth pointing out is that up and down the coast of Italy, various Italian coastal towns with five-star mayors, mayors from, from Five Star, which is apparently the, which is the, the coalition partner of the league, they were offering the boat to come to their towns. They were saying, come here. This, this, these are Salvini's coalition partners who are saying, come here. So we were all set up for a major split in Italy with the Navy doing the right thing, with five-star mayors welcoming these people, and Salvini 
trying grandstanding and trying to sort of draw the line in the sand and create a, a conflict o over, over what the NGOs have been doing. And then we'll talk about it later. Macron walks into this mm -hmm. with these, you know, rather insulting comments about Italy, which just unifies mm -hmm. the whole country behind Salvini. Rather insulting comments? You're saying there would have been a split but, uh, within the coalition if Macron hadn't <clears throat> spoken up? It hadn't happened yet, but it was, it was coming. I mean, you know, you've got all these mayors from Five Star up and down Hello. the Italian coast saying, come to our town, come to our ports. I mean, it's not up to a mayor to invite a ship in. So this, they're, they're grandstanding too. But... It's, it's not a united government on this issue, mm. but it is now. François Genom? Uh, I think two points. First, it is clear that Salvini, who was trying to make a political stand out of this, the arrivals in Italy are at a record low. They have never been lower since 2013. The arrivals numbers have been divided by three compared to 2017. So there is no migration crisis mm. in Italy. He's trying to make a crisis out of this to make a political stand. Two, Emmanuel Macron loses on both accounts. First, he's in a row with Italy now because of his comments, and he did not welcome the ship. Spain did, and therefore now he's facing a kind of divided majority in France with a dozen or so MPs from La République En Marche voicing critics and basically losing ground uh, domestically as well. So Spain is winning on both accounts, has good ties with Italy, and is welcoming the ship and looks good internationally. Macron loses on both accounts, which is surprising because he used to be good internationally. And, and, the, and the Germans have been very careful in their comments too, and suddenly now you might have not, this sort not, of Rome Not Berlin so careful it. as we'll not see later. Them. Not all of them. And Le Breton, let's just remind our viewers, uh, the French president had been coming under pressure for his silence at the, at the start of the week. Why aren't you weighing in on this? And then he does weigh in on Wednesday. Do you agree with, with Greg Viscusi that if he'd held his tongue just a little bit longer, it would have been a better move? Or if spoken sooner. Well, I think uh, we were all taken aback because we weren't expecting uh, France. The boat was very far away from France. And so we weren't expecting uh, to have to... Uh, you know, give a helping hand. It was up to Italy, according to maritime rules, to take in the ship. And of course, we should have uh, we should have said the right thing at the right moment. It was a split second. What, so, what what is the right thing? What the should... right thing. The right thing is if nobody wants to take the ship, we have to take it in. The right thing for me. But I think what happened is there was. That's not what the Interior Minister of of the Emmanuel Macron's government says. You're from that party. Yes, but as you know, there there has been uh, you know there there has been, there have been uh, member of parliaments who spoken differently, and I think it happened so fast that uh, France hadn't realized that it would be expected of her to you know actually say something at that point, and I, I think if we had taken that into account earlier, we would have said you know we would have welcomed the ship. Just to uh, remind, just to remind you, Jacques Millard. Emmanuel Macron, in that statement that was relayed by the government spokesperson, uh, calling uh, the Italian government cynical and irresponsible. Did he speak too soon or too late? I think this is a very clumsy commentary because I think that, of course, we can understand Italy because Italy is, you know, on the forefront of migration. And I do understand the Italy government that at one time there should be a clear message saying we don't come in any, anymore into Europe. Secondly, uh, France, of course, through the president, has uh, made so silly commentaries. You know, he should have said nothing. And this response, cynical attitude, is very unacceptable. Because, in fact, you know, it would have been much more, uh, you know, fundamental if he was to welcome the ship. But he did not do, because he knows that, in fact, we cannot really take any more migrants for many, many reasons. It doesn't mean that, of course, we can't help those people. We have to help them, but underground in Libya, in Sudan, in Africa, so that they don't come to Europe. And if we don't have a very clear policy, a very firm policy to say, sorry, you don't come anymore, we create permanently an appeal to come. And I think that the Spanish government made also a mistake because, you know, those people, when they are in Spain, they will come to France, they will try to go to Britain and so on. So I think this is a permanent trend that we have to face. And we need, we need, 
you know, united Europe on this issue. And of course, we don't have. It. All right, Jacques Mia, you say you, you, you're expressing sympathy for the position of uh, the Italian interior minister. Let's just listen to what Matteo Salvini said uh, before the Senate a little while earlier, again, pointing the finger at the French when he spoke to lawmakers. Based on the relocation accords of 2015, France had committed to take in 9,800 people. In three years, they've only taken in 640. I ask President Macron to put his words into actions and take in 9,000 migrants tomorrow morning, as they had promised. Jacques Miao, do you agree with that statement? <laughs> <laughs> I agree that we have to say and to face the situation. We are at the beginning, I say the beginning of migration. And if we don't say, you don't come anymore. And of course, there is no need to take. We but have France to made a promise. Do they have to keep that promise to take in those yeah, migrants? It was a lost promise, you know, because France has seen what happened in Germany and the race, you know, of the very right uh, uh, party, which is the AFD. So I think we have to be very careful. We cannot go this way. We need to have a united European policy to face this situation. And of course, you know, this kind of exchange between Italy and France is absolutely nonsense. And this is very grave. I think we have to reconsider and say we need to help those people where they come from to help them in Africa, to prevent they come to Europe. But if we carry on this way, we create a permanent appeal, because this is not the first time, unfortunately, that we have to save people who are on the near to drown in the Mediterranean Sea. So we have to face this situation and to work at the beginning of this trend and not at the end. Do you agree? Uh, so we just heard Jacques Miao say France is working, and this is the argument of Emmanuel Macron, is working in Libya, is working in West Africa to try and uh, improve things in the medium and long term. Uh, 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 but that if we let in anybody, we're, if we let in the people there, we're, we're, there'll be a pull factor. No, the only thing I agree with Mr. Miar is that Europe has to work together, and that is definitely a fact. But also Europe has to work on a different way of looking at immigration. We cannot go on. To, we, we've been led to talking about it in a certain way by 30 years of unemployment, of the rise of, you know, ex extreme right parties everywhere in Europe. And we have to fight back. We cannot go on uh, using the same arguments that the extreme right has been using to talk about this subject. We have to, tell, we, we have to change the way French people view uh, immigration. We have to start educating people to a different truth because it's what has been um, put forward is not is one truth and it's only one truth. And r really, we're not uh, the big country of immigration that people uh, think we are. We we don't we we're a big country where we have empty countryside. We can take in more people. It's a question of how we want to integrate them. And so we voted a law that's very strongly uh, looking at integration. And there is a whole uh, speech that has to be rethought. And children have to be taught also in school. France's history, our relationship uh, with Africa, the uh, Algerian war, which has never been talked about. We have to explain to people also why we have this relationship with the African con continent. All right. This is an opinion of some, but not all, uh, of the government. François Germain, you, you heard Jacques Miao mentioning that he thought Spain had made a mistake. And you got to say, when it comes to Spain, people are calling them saviors, the, at least those on the boat, for taking them in. But there is also a domestic political calculus. There's a new government there, and it wants to please the hard left. Uh, obviously, there is a domestic political calculus. This being said, I think that Spain did the right thing by welcoming the ship, and I think that Spain did what France should have done. And I very much agree with what Mrs. Le Breton just said, but now it is up to Emmanuel Macron to actually take up this challenge and try to make a kind of European proposal. Uh, there is a deep political divide in Europe on this issue. That's an issue that has been neglected. At the European level, that's an issue that Emmanuel Macron himself has personally neglected and has delegated a lot to his interior minister on this. And obviously, what we see today, I think, is the result of a crisis that we have left uh, coming along since 
certainly since 2014. Uh, just remind our viewers, Gregory Viscusi, Emmanuel Macron coming to power as a centrist, building a new party from scratch with some people from the center left, some people from the center right. From the outset, more than a year ago, people were predicting there'd be a rift. Is this the biggest test to his new party we've seen so far? Oh, I'm not sure if it's the biggest rift. Um, I think, I, I mean, there's was so much news today. I think his, maybe his comments about uh, about French welfare today is probably more divisive within this party. I bet I'll, I'll leave that to, to you. <laughs> I'll leave that to, to the other guests to say. No, but it certainly does show, show it just does definitely show that there is a divide, as there is a divide in the Italian government over this, which, which he has done a very good job of papering over. When we come back, we're going to take a look at uh, how it is playing over on the other <laughs> side of the Alps and across Europe. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate and we're seeing how uh, the rift over w whether or not to let in uh, stranded migrants uh, has uh, blown up between uh, France and Italy. Italy, which has shouldered the lion's uh, share of the burden in uh, Western Europe. Uh, currently, there's more than 170,000 asylum seekers there. A half million unregistered uh, migrants there, say officials. That's an estimate. And it was a big topic in the recent general election campaign that brought populists uh, to power. At stake, the rethink of the so-called Dublin Agreement that regulates asylum law on the continent. Ellen Gainsford has more. There's a fine balance between responsibility and solidarity, and the Dublin regulation tries to be it for the countries where migrants seek refuge. For the migrants, the European law is often what keeps them on or off the bus to shelters. But what does the Dublin regulation really say? Exceptions aside, it stipulates that the EU country where a migrant first enters is responsible for that person's asylum request. For the migrants and refugees, the hitch is that every EU country has its own rules. Some are more or less accepting. Pure geography means many southern and eastern European nations are the main entry and thus request point. Italy and Greece have called for a quota system. EU countries agreed to relocate 160,000 migrants across the bloc. But for now, less than 28,000 have been resettled. The Visegrad group, made up of four Eastern European countries, refused to participate in the scheme. What to do about the so-called Dubliners has become a bitter policy fight. The Dublin Accords are void because without a unified European asylum system, we're naturally in a situation where each nation passes the buck and where it's the migrants that bear the cost of this political fight. Already altered in the past, the Dublin regulation is currently in its third form. But after two and a half years of tense debate, is a Dublin 4.0 around the corner. Bulgaria drafted a proposal that would create financial incentives for welcoming nations and extend the duration of their responsibility. But it was quickly altered by southern member states. Now the clock is ticking. And there's a self-imposed deadline of the June 28th EU summit before Bulgaria, currently at the helm of the EU presidency, passes a baton to more conservative Austria. Countries like Hungary have already made their anti-immigrant status clear, which means that if the resolution is successfully altered, it's likely to be passed by a qualified, not absolute, majority and become fodder for many right-wing parties. For now, the EU is still deeply divided on immigration and the migrants remain in limbo. Hey, we're going to be talking about uh, a little bit later on about the passing of the baton when it comes to the rotating EU presidency from Bulgaria to Austria uh, in a while with our guests uh, who include François Gemmen, who we saw in that report. We're also, by the way, with uh, Anne Le Breton, Paris Municipal Councillor, Gregory Viscusi of Bloomberg News, and the mayor of the Paris suburb of Maison Lafitte, Jacques Mian. Uh, François Gemmen, you, Ellen Gainsford's report there, talk of changing the rules, making, giving financial incentives. What can we do to get beyond the finger pointing here? Well, I think this is clearly a make or break issue for the European Union. And clearly, the European project itself is, seems to be in tatters and, and is a threat because of this migration issue, because of the deep divide within Europe, within European countries, also within 
uh, majority parties and within government. So what can be done? I think there needs to be a European approach to this. As the report said, there are 28 asylum systems at the moment in the EU that cannot work. With 28 different asylum systems, the Dublin regulation cannot work, and everyone agrees on this. So what is needed is a European approach with safe and legal pathways to Europe. Number one, to halt the humanitarian tragedy in the Mediterranean. Number two, we need a European asylum agency that would regulate the asylum claims across Europe. That document is ready since March. It is ready by, it has been prepared by the European Commission. For the moment, the European governments do not want it. They think that they will be able to better regulate what they call a crisis with the national sovereignty. I think this is a deep mistake. Clearly, this is a European issue. The solution needs to be a European one. And we saw, again, the results of the Italian elections. And the Italians, well, they pointing the finger a lot at France, particularly over the sending back uh, of uh, refugees and migrants across that border they share in Ventimiglia. Uh, uh, yeah, where the French have reimposed border controls. No, obviously the Italians feel very alone. I mean, you know, you've got, I mean, the numbers are way down. This year there's only 14,000 that have arrived so far this year, but it's 300,000 over the past two years. Um, it's a lot for a country like Italy that's had no growth in in, in 20 years. Um, most of these migrants don't want to stay in Italy. I mean, a lot of them are from French-speaking Africa. They've got family in France. They want to get further north in Europe, and they're blocked at the border by France and by Austria, and they can't get out of Italy. So um, it, it's naturally become a major issue in Italy. Now, it's been instrumentalized by people like Salvini, who have made it seem like a much bigger problem than it was. I mean, he tried to claim during the campaign that there's a big crime wave caused by these migrants. There's not. But Still, Italy has been left alone. I mean, there's, just he, no, there's no question about it. Italy's been left alone by the rest of Europe. He has a point on this. Yeah. Italy has been left alone yeah. on this since 2014. It's worth remembering that the Italian government in 2014 launched a search and rescue operation called Marinos Room, similar to the one of the Aquarius boat, and had to interrupt it for, because there was no solidarity, no cooperation at all within Europe. And so what we see at the moment, the rise of populism and extremism, is the result of leaving countries like Italy, like Hungary, like Greece, completely alone. And the Italians just don't want to take lessons from anyone on this. Mm. I mean, probably no organization has saved more lives in history than the Italian mm -hmm. Navy the past few years, and they just don't want to take mm -hmm. lessons. So when a guy like Macron starts talking about being cynical and irresponsible, it, it, it drives everybody crazy in Italy. And the, what well, you... obviously, we also have the, the same problem. We, you know, we, if we had not been elected, uh, we had Marine Le Pen, who was very close to uh, winning the election. And I think it's very much in the mind of, Presid uh, pr of uh, President Macron. And uh, we know that if we don't uh, succeed in what we were elected to do, uh, we might face that risk again next time. But the so French didn't, didn't let that boat in. In fact, they, 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 well, they told, think, the, they told the separatist regional government in Corsica not to let the boat in. Well, that was uh, the, separate, the Corsican separatists who tried to... Uh, there was but no, why not let that boat in? Because there was no Corsica. real port that was very... Uh, where you could possibly, uh, I think, uh, dock the boat in the first place. But anyway, I think what happened there uh, was, and it, I'm speaking only for myself, but was a mistake of timing. And I think if we had had, uh, you know, realized that this was what was expected of us, we would have done the right thing, which for, for me, again, I'm only sp he, speaking for myself, would have been to do the humanitarian thing and to take the people in. Over because in Berlin, the conservative Austrian chancellor uh, on a two-day visit, Sebastian Kurz, who is in his country in coalition with the far right and who takes over, as we were saying earlier, the rotating presidency of the EU next month. Kurz seeing Angela Merkel's more conservative partner, Bavarian leader Horst Seehofer, who, like Matteo Salvini in Italy, happens to be interior minister. I had a phone conversation with the Italian interior minister, Matteo Salvini, yesterday, and it was his wish that Rome, Vienna and Berlin, on the level of interior minister, should cooperate on security, the fight against terrorism and on the key issue of migration. I have accepted and we have talked about it. In our view, we need an axis of the willing in the fight against illegal immigration, and we are happy that with you as German Interior Minister, we have a strong partner in the fight. 
Jacques Mial, your reaction uh, to hearing Sebastian Kurz in the company of the leader of the uh, CSU, the Conser Bavarian Conservatives, talking about an axis of the willing. I did not get your point because the line was very bad. Can you repeat the question, please? What are your What is your What are your thoughts about the uh, the Austrian Chancellor in Berlin alongside the uh, conservative German Interior Minister, Mr. Seehofer, talking about an axis of the willing when it comes to the uh, migration issue? Well, I, I, I frankly, frankly speaking, I think that all those reaction are just uh, reaction on the spot, you know. And uh, in fact, we should realize that this is not the crisis of today. This is a crisis which is going to last and last and last. So if we are not going able to have genuine, uh, you see, response to this permanent trend of migration, I think we are just going to have damages in our public opinion, even sometimes very strong reaction. So this is not a question of right, of left, or the middle or center. This is a question that we have to look in a very objective way and to prevent those people to come. Because if we don't say very clearly, you are not going to come, but we are going to help you to stay at home and uh, you know with huge, huge aid, then we are not going to have peace and this will explode one day or the other. François Genome, you agree? No. Um, I, I think what Jacques Millard needs to understand is that we are indeed facing a kind of structural phenomenon. And that it's not about making people stay at home. And actually, if you increase development aid, that means that people will have more access to migration. So thinking that you will use development aid as a way to reduce migration that will just not work and produce counterproductive effect. Uh, it's just that migration are rooted in inequalities, either real or perceived inequalities, and we are facing a kind of structural trend. So what is really needed is basically to accept that Europe is now a multicultural continent, that immigration is part of Europe, and that uh, given that this is a structural no. phenomenon, the best we can do is to try to organize it for the better, for the better of no, the migrants, no, no. of the destination communities and of the origin communities. The more we will try to resist migration and to close the border, the more humanitarian crisis this will induce. But there clearly are limits no, to what Europe can absorb, not. no? No, oh, yeah, I mean, the limit way. is that there will not be, they, there no. won't be more people coming at the moment. I mean, there are three percent of the world population who are international migrants. It's still of really, of really limited minority. And the thing is, there, there is a tendency to think that if you welcome people better, more people will come. That doesn't work like that. that Jacques Millard. I agree. Jacques Millard, and then, and then, and then Anne Le Breton. To play God by this uh, absolutely so-called humanitarian policy, this is absolutely the opposite that you should do. Because when you say, we had also example in the past, when, you know, in Spain, they realized they regularized migrants. They came over. They came over. So what you say, you are just playing God. This is very dangerous. We have to say you don't come. Well, I, I'm not in power, I... Mr. Mia. I'm just a researcher. Okay. No. no, I cannot pretend to play God. <laughs> I'm no Breton. You play God. Play God. No, I'm I... sorry. I, I think there's something else that you uh, forgot in, your, in what you said, is that migration is worldwide. We're now, uh, uh, we're, the whole world goes everywhere in all ways. So you have more uh, inter-African uh, migrations than you have from south to north. You have migrations, our own children migrate and go and live in other places. Migration is part of the world to come. I'm sorry, Monsieur Millard, but... The migration is something you might have even children who live abroad yourself. I certainly do. Uh, at the moment, so, there are more Portuguese people migrating to Angola than the other way around. And so we so, might be under the impression of a kind of invasion or submission of Europe. This is not like that if you look at the global figures. And, and Africa, Africa is, uh, the, the, Africa is changing. There's a huge growth in Africa. When this growth starts kicking in really people will want to stay you even have people now who are going back from united states to nigeria so there is a different reality that we don't talk about enough and that's the reality that i think we need to put forward Jacques Millard. Uh, yes i would say that of course in africa you have many migrations this is true you have south 
south, you have uh, south, north, this is true. But you see, uh, it is also true that in Africa, we can really settle people down and we can have them stay home if we bring, you know, appropriate aid. And of course, if you look at the aid of France, it has been reduced for the past six years. So this is a question of aid also, but we have to make very clear that if you come, you will go back. Take Spain, for instance. Spain has, a, you know, signed agreement with many African states and people go back as well. You know, today, Syrians go back to Syria again. So this trend is not one way. We have to master those trends, but we have to make clear our policy. And our policy today is something dubious. You know, people believe that they will come to Europe, they will have a time for two or three months, and then they will settle down in France. This is a wrong policy. This is a question of announcement. Our policy should be clear. And this is why I am very upset by the present French government who cannot take courageously a very clear cut in this policy. Our policy is very clear. We have just, ele no, we have just voted for a law that has clarified a lot of things. And I'm very, ha really, really happy to hear you say that people go back because that is something that usually you don't say and that French people need to know that it's not only not one way. way, people come, people go away, and when we should show the full figures, that was, that's part of the, in, uh, the education factor that I really promote. All right, we're running short on time. I just want to, I want to ask a well, well, quick, quick question to Gregory Viscusi here because this is a new unprecedented populist coalition that we're seeing in Italy. We've talked about the row here in France, but let's have a moment here to talk about Italy. You have the uh, anti-establishment five-star movement, a brand new party in a coalition with uh, the more seasoned, you might say, league. It used to be called the Northern League of Matteo Salvini. Less than two weeks in, all the headlines on this side of the Alps are Salvini this, Salvini that. Has Salvini played Luigi Di Maio? Has he basically bowled him out of the picture? He has, and for two reasons. One, he's is more seasoned, as, as you put it. Two, the complete collapse of Silvio Berlusconi's party has meant that the center-right has basically shifted over to Salvini. So we've seen since, since the election, we've seen the polls have shown that Five Star has lost popularity, partly because they promised they never would enter into coalitions. And for a lot of their voters, this is just a complete, you know, mm -hmm. horror that they're entering into a, a coalition with the League. So they've lost support. Meanwhile, the League has just been picking up voters from Silvio Berlusconi's party because that's just sort of floundering. And so when, when the talks to form a government stalled and there was talk of going back to a new election, the league would have come out of those elections much stronger than Five Star. And so Five Star was, was forced to, to, to cut a deal, basically. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so that, that's the situation we're in. So from Is having Matteo been a junior Salvini? partner, he's at least now a, an even partner, at least an equal partner. Now, the, the, um, the, the prime minister, his name is Giuseppe Conte, uh, he's nominally, you might say, the prime minister, but who's the real leader well, that, of Italy that, today? That, that we don't know. We don't know a thing like Tria today, the finance minister who cancels his visit to Paris. Did he decide that? I rather doubt it. He, he, he's he, he's, he's, a, prof he's a, a professor, an economist. I, I don't see him grandstanding like this. He was told not to come. Who told him not to come? I don't know. I mean, as you said, we're, 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 learning, how this, we're learning how this is working. We'll, we'll see when Conte comes here on Friday, if he comes. Um, sort of how much of his own man he seems to be. But, you know, you're asking good questions, but we don't have the answers yet. And let's not forget that Austria will take over the presidency of the EU on July the 1st, which means that Italy, oh, well, Salvini, mm -hmm. will have a really close ally at the top of the EU Council. We'll have a close ally. Having uh, Sebastian Kurz, who's in uh, uh, a coalition with the far-right Freedom Party uh, and whose views on, on, on migration are... Uh, tougher than, uh, than, than even uh, that of the Italians, uh, it seems. Uh, w what's going to happen as far as that goes? Well, just to go back to Five Star, I just finished it. Five Star is a very eclectic movement, and it goes from people who actually are anti-immigrant. There are people within Five Star mm -hmm. anti-immigrant. But there's also people within Five Star who come out of associations that take care of immigrants. So they, they com they, they're on the complete spectrum on this issue, Five Star. So they've got no unified line, which makes it a lot easier for Salvini to impose his. Oh, as far as a European coalition, I mean, that is... That is Salvini's dream to set up some sort of, you know, block against what he sees as being the sort of the immigrationist 
policies of France and Germany. But bizarrely, he's, he's going into alliances with parties who refuse to take in any immigrants, like Hungary and like Poland, when the, the problem for Italy, it's not the number of people arriving in Italy, it's the fact that they're not able to go elsewhere in Europe afterwards. That's the problem facing Italy. So he's making alliances with people who want to block any flows of migration within Europe, when it's, when it's within Italy's interest to have as much migration within Europe as possible so that those people arriving in Italy can go where they want to go, which is northern Europe. So the, 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 the migrant crisis putting the, the French under, under strain domestically, <clears throat> putting the Italians under strain. Our Berlin correspondent earlier telling us, François Genome, that uh, Horst Seehofer, the interior minister, and Angela Merkel, the chancellor, are barely speaking to one another these days. Yeah, apparently so. And, uh, and uh, you've, you might have seen the news today that the German interior ministers would like to build a kind of axis with Austria and Italy, anti-migrants, which would be, I think, a major role within the German government. We know very well the position of Angela Merkel on, on this. So clearly, the divide in Europe has never been stronger on these issues within governments and within the EU member states. So some governments need to come up with a very strong proposal so that there is a kind of long-standing solution to the challenges of migration in this century. François Genome, Anne Le Breton, Gregory Vescuzzi, and Jacques Millard, I want to thank all four of you for joining us here in the France 24 debate. Stay with us. Media Watch is next. And we say hello to Shona Bhattacharya. Good evening. Hi, Francois. So the, uh, the, the, we can call it an escalation, right? That's right. Uh, I'm sure you've been talking about it for the last hour, but just to, to sum things up, uh, things are getting pretty heated between France and Italy, especially with Italian Prime Minister uh, Giuseppe Conte and Emmanuel Macron uh, scheduled to meet on Friday. France says that meeting is still on. We'll see if it does take place. Uh, but Italian uh, Interior Minister Matteo Salvani had harsh words uh, for Macron and the French government as a whole uh, after Macron said that Rome had acted with cynicism and irresponsibility by refusing to accept the Aquarius. And he has called on Macron to apologize. I wanted to start this media watch by taking a look at this uh, crisis from Italy's perspective. Uh, in uh, the Corriere della Sera, which I'm sorry I don't speak perfect Italian, uh, there is a series of cartoons um, starting with this one, um, Macron in words. Uh, here he is uh, vomiting the word fraternité. Uh, from uh, the Italian perspective, he's not doing a very good job of it. Um, and then we've got others in the same series um, with the big fish uh, scaring away the little Aquarius fish there. Uh, and then uh, the series uh, kind of continues. There is one in particular that I like a lot. Uh, and it is this one. So this is a warning, a, a navigation warning up at the top there. And then there you have a migrant in the boat saying, does that mean that we're saved? And the person in the boat, the other migrant, says, no, it's Salvini, basically. Uh, Play the on words. Interior minister telling us to go away. Uh, now then, uh, we'd like to I'd like to continue this with a, a more a broader perspective uh, with this cartoon that was in the <laughs> Courrier International. So it is a, um, what are they called? Uh, pinball. Pinball machine. Pinball <laughs> machine, exactly. Thank you very much. Pinball machine with the different countries kind of, you know, uh, trying to avoid uh, the pinball there, the same kind of... Um, spirit in this cartoon, which is a, a chess match uh, using the heads of migrants uh, as pawns uh, in the political game uh, amongst the leaders uh, of Europe. Um, and then, uh, meanwhile, this French cartoonist named Cac has this cartoon uh, in French of Emmanuel Macron uh, saying in French, you know, <laughs> are any of you perchance able to save children from uh, high rises? Are you able to, are you, yeah, because, uh, an allusion to, an that, allusion <coughs> to that, that Malian who's... Ma Mamadou Gassama, exactly, who saved on, on May 26th the child and, dangling and, and who arrived via Italy. from a bank... A yeah. balcony and, and who, who arrived, arrived via, via Italy. Italy. Yeah. I do I must say, I, I think there's a problem with this cartoon because I mean Mamadou Gassama was African and the people in Aquarius are many of them African and it's just kind of it's weird that the people in the drawing are not. But mm -hmm. anyway, that's a, just a <laughs> A moot point, maybe. Um, I just want to end on one Twitter user who 
saw a, a parallel between what's going on now and other stories in the past where mm -hmm. refugees, especially in boats, uh, have been turned back, back uh, from ports. There's this uh, nine, uh, 2014 BBC article about uh, a ship of Jewish refugees uh, that left Germany and that nobody wanted. It was in 1939, 900 Jews who all had passports, uh, visas for Cuba and then hoping to make it to the United States. They were turned back. They all had to go back to Europe, and of the 900, some 250 of them ended up being killed by Nazi forces or in concentration camps. Shona Bhattacharya, many thanks. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.